Okay, so the webinar has started and I am going to, um, uh, are you sure you want to? So we're recording to the cloud, okay. All set. Okay, so welcome to the Board of Health meeting, the Amherst Board of Health meeting and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law General Laws 30A, Section 20. This meeting of the Amherst Board of Health will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. For information on remote participation, please see the agenda on the Board of Health website. There you will find the Zoom link and directions for telephone dial-in. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio recording of the meeting. Approved meeting minutes will be posted on the Amherst Board of Health website as soon as possible after the meeting. So, welcome. And the first Item on the agenda is reviewing the minutes from September 8th. You need a roll call? Nancy? Pardon me? Oh, roll, roll call. call. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All my tech, tech problems. Okay, roll call. Tim? Here. Maureen? Maureen? Can you hear me? You're you're you maybe are muted, Maureen. I am muted. I, okay. I've been coughing a lot, so I've been trying oh. to spare everybody this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Maureen's here, and I'm here. Lauren is not here. She's absent. Have did you hear from Lauren at all? I've been interacting with her during the week, and I saw her. Um, and I know she's planning on be here, um, but I'll keep monitoring the attendees to see if she jumps in. So. Okay, and we have a special guest, Emily. And um, so now we will review the minutes. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes? And thank you, Nancy Schroeder, for doing the minutes. I didn't find any issues with the minutes. Neither did I. So can I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll move to accept the minutes of the September 8th, 2022 meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay, so we have public comment on agenda topics only. And I don't see any. I don't see any raised hands. No. No raised hands. Okay. No. Yeah. So all business. Um, we have the toxic chemical regulations. And Tim, um, Jen and I talked about it in preparing for this meeting, and there are a lot of other variables that need to be considered, um, especially with facilities management. So I would like to make a motion, and then we can discuss it, that we set up a subcommittee that you and Lauren um, chair that has someone from facilities management and Jen as an ad hoc member to take the, um, the regulation forward with necessary revisions and additions um, to meet all the standards. So this is the motion. I think we need to have it seconded, then we discuss it. Or do we discuss it and then second it? I'm I'll second the motion. <laughs> I'm forgetting Robert's rules. Okay. Um, so all in favor, Maureen? Aye. To, to open it. For, oh, no. Now we have discussion. Discussion. So right. Now we're going to discuss the, the motion. 
of having a subcommittee for the board with um, Tim and Lauren, Jen ad hoc, and someone's from facilities management. And Jen, can you give your input here so that Tim knows what we were talking about briefly? Right. So last month I said, I'd like to take a look at it, you know, as the health director. And, and you guys said that would be okay. And I really, I approached it as like, you know, I'll just sort of go, go through this and give some comments and we'll, we'll keep going. But when I started looking into it, I was thinking this is such an important topic and let's, let's do it right. And I got some input from other departments. And I think we really need to sit down and, and, and take a look at um, you know our wording and what our goals are because you know it seems like we, we we had shifted a little bit and I just want to make sure that we are focusing on something that's um, the the right things and that's something that we can really implement and for example um, when I spoke to the facilities uh, maintenance manager. Um, I said, you know, what, what do you, how do you look at um, different chemicals, you know, you pick the least toxic. He says he actually doesn't choose the product with the least amount of toxicity, but, but those that meet the green seal requirement and their compliance list. So there's, there's different wording and different things um, that are involved. And I just think we should bring that all together. And, you know, how are we going to make it consistent? Um, you know, one thing is to make it consistent from building to building. So I think there's a lot to, uh, to consider, and I'd like to be part of it, if that's possible. You know, this interests me. I think it's, it's something that interests the, the town, and how can we do it? Okay, I'm just trying to, to tech, uh, send a message to Lauren, too. So what do you think, Tim? So... Instead of a subcommittee, it's not like we are going to rewrite everything. <laughs> I'm just curious if they could enter there as comments uh, on certain wordings if they if they wanted to change. I think uh, if, if that will be the best way to go. Uh, I think it looks like it's only certain clarifications on what they mean by toxic chemicals or if they have any compliance type of requirements. If they could add this as comments and I could take a look at it again, that might be an easy one. I think having subcommittee and I'm, I'm a little worried about my time, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think this could, I mean, if it's going to be substantial change, I, I think a subcommittee might be good. But if it's going to be some clarifications, why need a subcommittee? Well, then, I mean, that's something, you know, if, if that's what the board wants, I can take it back and look, because when I looked at the um, the previous standing um, uh, regulations and the ones compared it to the draft, and I know it's just a draft, it seemed like there was different focus, you know, before it was, originally, I thought it was limited to cleaning and office products, um, but that's not, not the case. And now it seems to be extended to the schools. Um, and then that variances should come through the health director. Um, I don't think it should come through me. Um, I think we need some wording on that. How are we going to implement that? And now if the board really wants me to do that, it's something that, you know, I'll, I'll figure out and I'll do it. Um, but I don't think that's the best thing. Use, I don't have that expertise. Um, mm -hmm. It would take a big amount of time. It would mean other things would have to you know, come off my plate. And so I'd rather have experts involved in with this. Um, Who are the experts that would be helpful that, you, that you're that you aware of, Jen? Well, I think when we think about purchasing, uh, <coughs> the people that are making these green choice purchases already, and I don't know if people actually knew about our regulations. Some may have, but I don't, I want this to be a good regulation that people, you know, pay attention to, and it has has some bite to it. If we just put a regulation out there and no one knows about it, you know, that doesn't do us very. People do, doesn't do well by the people, the residents, or the, you know, the the town employees as well. So, so that's that's what I'm thinking about the maintenance, you know, facilities manager. Yeah. I I think you know we 
I mean, e, there is EPA regulations, DEP regulations, a uh, lot of other regulations. I think this one is some sort of a, not as a binding rule that you have to do this or that, you know, it's primarily we're saying to consider alternatives, you know, but if they don't have it, we also have a way we are saying, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. just let us know, you know, <laughs> that type of thing, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the best way is uh, if you, can add comments to those sections you feel it's okay. same thing you, you know if um, the the facilities people i think probably looking they're looking at uh, alternative toxic you know uh, less toxic chemicals you know if they just highlight that one put a comment saying that we need this to be clarified or something then i think we can go to the second um, revision stage where I, I you know we could take a look at what type of other compliance um, regulations are already there, which will, which regulates the facilities, and we could update it, and then I can bring it back to the committee, you know, see, you know, what they think, and then the facilities also can take a look at it, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that, that might be the better way to, if they could add those comments, you know, specifically for the document, uh, and then you also can add to that. I think mm -hmm. we can move from there. I mean, that's that sounds fine to me. And I think that's that's part of my purpose here, speaking with you. Is it, 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 I I thought I would have it done for you today, but I think it's, it'll need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to keep chugging away at that if that's what you know folks want. And again, I just you know I I, I know I keep coming back to this, but I don't know if I'm we we'll figure it out. How are things going to be in compliance? Um, it's it shouldn't be you know through the health director specific. Mm -hmm. There needs to be something in place, um, but that's very solvable. We can talk about it. Okay, so should I just withdraw my, can I withdraw my motion or do we vote on it? Well, we can vote on the motion. Maureen, were you going to say something? I just wondered how much input you can get and, and if the purchasing is the same from department to department in terms of mm -hmm products that are on this list that that seems to be a quote greener list mm -hmm. um what your sense of that is in the town yeah so so i think my my thinking is that it might be building to building it's not mm -hmm. just, but i'm not sure but that's something that we could really work on yeah um when you say facilities managers it's only one person or many people I believe it's, it's um, the, the facilities maintenance manager is, is one person that oversees the, the buildings. Oversees all the buildings? I don't, I'm not sure. I can get you the answer. I mean, usually the decisions are made if it's one person, probably mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. making the procurement decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think if, if, if uh, the manager can add some some sort of mark those areas where he wants more he or she wants to more clarification mm -hmm. but also um, any documents um, that, could, that could be added to that in terms of for my review or whatever it is to mm -hmm. see if there are there is a specific procedure to look at alternative green ones or is there any list already existing that would be helpful for when when I rewrite it you know so Okay, I I mean, th that sounds fine if that's what the board decides. Um, and then, you know, just from my being a TA, just looking at the document from a point of view of just making sure it flows, some of the, um, you know, references were outdated. And I know there's some real, like, zeitgeist articles in there. Like, I even remember Landergren, you know, there are these great names in there. So those articles should stay. But, you know, I think some of the, the citations were outdated, so they just need to be um, a little, little boost of modification and updated. Um, that just takes a little time, you know, so I can, I can certainly do that. I, I think it's, you know, we shouldn't hurry. I agree. Okay. So, uh, I think some of the citations were just coming from the previous document. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so probably they could be updated, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, I think the very first line is there are 50,000 known chemicals used 
by human. And, and like I did a quick search and someone said there's actually 350,000 now. So I don't know if that's true, but I just think everything is, uh, is a little different. Okay, so should I withdraw my motion or do we vote on it? I'm gonna withdraw my motion. And um, we will just continue working on, on the toxic chemicals with input from you, Jen, and from facilities management. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jim, for yeah. your input. That's very important. Thank you. Oh, well, I was going to thank you guys for allowing me to do this because I think it's really interesting. And I think we have a good group here to, to bring it all together. So you're welcome. And I, I look forward to working on it. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have a community assessment. And we have Emily Connors who is a graduate student in the School of Public Health who worked very hard over the summer on phase two of quantitative data collection, moving more to the social determinants of health. And I'm gonna turn it over to her for her to present um, the information. Okay. I will okay. share my screen, oh, that's okay. okay. And thank you once again for your wonderful work. Thank you for all the support, Nancy. I appreciate it. Um, Jen, it looks like I am not able to share my screen. I'm going to give that to you. Hold on a second. Thank you. What's really been okay. nice that Emily presents is she, she asks lots of great questions from the data she sees. Um, that's great yeah. okay Emily okay can everyone see that screen okay yes all right okay thank you everyone for uh, giving me the time to present the work I've been doing on the second phase of the health assessment I will jump right into my slides so a quick introduction um, the intentions of this project um, we're intending to give the Amherst Health Department, Board of Health, and other community groups comprehensive information in order to identify needs, prioritize decisions, identify ways to reach at-risk disenfranchised populations, address systemic health problems and concerns of our community members, promote equity, and guide advocacy efforts and policy development. Um, so a quick overview of the process. We've broken the assessment into three phases. I presented on the first phase um, at the end of the spring last year with Bailey Glenn. Um, and this presentation is gonna focus on the second phase of the assessment, which I worked on um, over this past summer. Uh, just a quick overview. I'll talk about the census tracts in a, a few of the different sections of the presentation. Um, but in Amherst, we have North Amherst, the UMass track, Amherst Center, Central Amherst, East Amherst, South Amherst, and Hampshire College as the census tracts. Um, and I have a little map on the right to give you a visual representation of that. So the first section I'll discuss is economics. Um, here I have a graph of per capita income by census track. Um, and then I have a comparison of the US estimate um, for some scale here. So um, we can see that East Amherst has the highest per capita income, um, followed closely by South Amherst, um, North Amherst, and Amherst Center. Um, and the remaining three census tracts uh, have significantly lower per capita incomes. Um, those being the UMass track, Central Amherst or Amherst College and Hampshire College. So uh, the low per capita income is obviously explained by the large portion of college students living in those tracks. So this is not super surprising to us. Um, next, we can look at employment in the town. Um, North Amherst, South Amherst, East Amherst and Amherst Center all have pretty comparable um, percentages of employed uh, versus unemployed and not in the labor force. Um, we see around 60% um, of residents being employed in each of these tracks. 
Um, and we can compare this to the remaining three census tracts, again, the three tra tracts uh, of the main colleges in town. Um, and we can see across these three census tracts that um, the majority of um, residents are not in the labor force, around 59 <coughs> to 49%. Um, so that is a large portion of people not working. So during phase three, kind of looking into uh, information about how students are affecting the economic functionality of the town um, and how this is affecting non-community members is of interest. Um, so like I just said, the main focus uh, for phase three um, that I'm suggesting is how students are kind of affecting the town in terms of economics. Next, I'll talk briefly about transportation within the town. So the um, PVTA provides Amherst with um, the main uh, sort of public transportation. Um, it provides transportation throughout Amherst and the surrounding areas, um, but it is important to recognize the seasonality and inconsistencies of these services, at least in Amherst. Um, we see changes in the bus schedules in accordance with the university and college schedules, as well as general holidays, which can have a major effect on residents who are relying on the bus as their sole source of transportation. Um, and I'll talk about this more later in the presentation, but um, we found that the majority of Amherst residents are living in a USDA designated food desert. So a substantial portion of residents do not have convenient or reliable access to supermarkets. So losing access to bus routes can mean that they have no way of getting groceries. Um, there's also rules regarding number of bags allowed on the buses as well as space of bags on um, buses. And for many parts of Amherst, you need multiple combination of bus routes just to get to uh, major shopping plazas. And it's important to note that transportation can be a problem for activities outside of just getting groceries. Um, so we look at you know, access to getting to the polls to vote, um, healthcare services and doctor's appointments, getting prescriptions filled, getting to social gatherings and events, all these things can be affected by a lack of access to transportation. So the main takeaway here is obviously the PVTA is the main form of public transportation within Amherst. However, inconsistencies in schedules um, and all these other things play a key access a key factor in access and ability for residents um, to use the bus um, in order to have access to key resources. So in phase three, looking at how residents are actually using public transportation and where are the gaps in services and how we can improve accessibility to key uh, resources for residents living without cars. Next, I'll talk about uh, the recreation department. So we see in Amherst that there are various parks and recreational facilities, um, lots of playgrounds, sports fields, pools, um, parks, et cetera. Um, and the recreation department does have a nice website that includes all programs offered for various ages um, and groups. Mainly these uh, activities include a handful of sports and these may not be suitable for um, all groups of children and adults. Um, so overall, the assessment of the rec programs available point to major holes. Um, we see a lack of activities for both children and adults involving arts, music, second language programs, cooking, computer skills, all these things. Um, so that was very interesting to find. So the main takeaway, obviously, from this section is the lack of um, activities for both children and adults. Um, and in phase three, looking into the reason for the lack of activities through the rec department and how community members feel about the range of activities available and what changes they would like to see. Next, I'll talk about education within the town. So I'll start um, focusing on the elementary schools within town. Um, there are three elementary schools with around 1,000 students across the three, ranging from pre-K to sixth grade. We can see on the left a distribution of 
student race and ethnicities. So the majority of students being white, um, followed by Hispanic students, Asian, African-American, and multi-race non-Hispanic students. Um, on the right, we can see a distribution of selected populations within the uh, schools. So we can see the largest por uh, percentage of students are considered high needs at around 52%. Also around 39% are considered low income. And we can see the percentages of students with disabilities, first languages that are not English, as well as English language learners. Um, so just to get a little bit of scale here, um, we can see a distribution of selected population percentages um, for the elementary schools versus the state percentages. So Amherst elementary schools um, have percentages above the state for first language not being English, English language learners, and students with disabilities. So looking into how the schools are serving these selected populations is of interest. Um, next, we'll look at the same kind of distributions for the regional, middle, and high school. So uh, there's two schools in this district, um, the middle school and the high school, uh, around 1,300 students in grades 7 to 12. Again, on the left, we can see student race and ethnicity distribution. Again, um, mainly white students, followed by Hispanic, Asian, African American, and multi-race non-Hispanic students. And on the left, again, the distribution of selected populations within the school. Again, a high percentage of um, high need students and low income students here. Um, and here we see the uh, middle and high school percentages versus the state. So the Amherst Pelham Regional Middle and High School District falls below the state percentages for um, all of the selected populations except for uh, students with disabilities. So looking into programs that support um, students with disabilities is of interest here. Um, we also found the accountability classification for the regional district um, somewhat interesting. It is um, classified as needing focused tar and targeted support due to low participation rate of Hispanic and Latino subgroups, um, which is an interesting finding. So in conclusion, um, overall for at least the regional middle and high school, we don't have data uh, surrounding students living specifically in Amherst. Um, all of the data that I presented uh, before includes students coming from all of the different surrounding towns within the regional district. Um, and also the regional school district being classified as needing intervention and assistance. So investigating in phase three data uh, surrounding students specifically in Amherst, as well as looking at progress being made to improve participation rates of certain groups um, with, and how the community feels in general about the school system is of interest. Next, I'll briefly talk about the environment. Um, the main concern we found here was food access. So as I said before, 97% of Amherst residents do live in a USDA designated food desert. Um, we also found that one in four residents um, is low income and living more than a mile away from the closest supermarket. Um, and access to cars and public transportation um, makes accessing healthy and nourishing food difficult for many residents of Amherst. We do see an intervention in the Amherst mobile market, um, which is making produce available at more affordable prices um, within walking distance of certain residential areas. Um, and this is a really fantastic intervention, but it is seasonal, uh, meaning that starting mid-October, it no longer operates. So year round access to fresh nutritious food is a continuing obstacle. Um, here we see a um, graph regarding vehicle access within the town. Um, it's depicting the percentage of households that do not have a vehicle that are more than half a mile away from the nearest market. Um, so we can see that across Amherst, um, many households 
um, do not have access to cars and live more than half a mile away from a grocery store. UMass is the tract that contains the largest percentage of households, followed by Central Amherst and Amherst Center. Center. Um, so increasing access to grocery stores and nutritious food is an important um, area for further research in Amherst. Um, and this is basically what I said before, but um, in addition, kind of looking into interventions that could be feasible within Amherst um, and in what areas and how they can be helpful is an important focus for phase three. Uh, next, I'll discuss healthcare services within the town. So um, obviously there are many different services that are provided within the town. Um, there's primary care practices, mental health services, dentistry, senior care, all this stuff. Um, we also have the Musanti Clinic and Tapestry Health, which are examples of programs that are trying to increase access to healthcare services. Um, Throughout the next phase, an important focus is going to be on how accessible these services actually are within the town and where the shortcomings are in terms of availability of care, um, how these clinics and affordable options are being used within the community, and um, where are areas of improvement that can be made to better serve the community. Last, I'll briefly discuss um, government and policy within the town. So as I'm sure um, most of you are aware, there is um, the legislature. So the registered voters of the town elect the town council, which is 13 members. Three um, members are considered councilors at large and 10 of these members are known as district councilors. There's also an executive town manager, Paul Bachelman, who is responsible for all town departments, employees, and functions aside from schools and libraries. Um, the, and then there's the five member, member school committee and the six member library board of trustees. Um, some key takeaways from the government section are um, obviously the town switched to implement a new form of government, um, the town council fairly recently. We also see two political action committees within the town, the Amherst Ford and the Progressive Coalition of Amherst. So looking forward to phase three, um, kind of investigating community satisfaction with the new form of town government, um, community views on political action committees and um, gathering the main concerns of residents surrounding policies and politics within the town are key focus areas. So um, looking beyond to phase three, we're kind of looking to put an emphasis on collecting data that is more relevant and representative of the Amherst community. Um, so we're gonna be doing this through focus groups and listening sessions, as well as key informant interviews. Um, and at, through having more detailed data from uh, the community directly, we will be able to kind of supplement the findings um, from both phases one and two and further allow for the development of effective interventions um, in areas of concern raised during the first two phases. So thank you all for listening and thank you, Nancy, again, for your continued support um, throughout this project. That's all I have. Okay. That's wonderful, Amy. Hi, Emily. Um, do board members have any questions for Emily? Maureen, Tim, Jen, do you have any questions or comments? Well, I wanted to say thank you, Emily. We are distributing some antigen, rapid antigen tests, and we're using the list that you created. So it's it's in use. Thank you for doing that. And I really am interested in the PBTA. That's the schedule. You know, I was up at the Amherst Survival Center this past Monday giving um, COVID shots and the, the bus schedule was on reduced, you know, uh, a route and there were less people there, you know, getting food, the other services. So I think it's a big, big issue and further research is needed there. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
Maureen, so, Tim? Uh, UMass, uh, many students, they, they access from the dining commons and everything. They don't need to go to the grocery stores, even though they are far away. You know? So they are, I'm just curious, you know, how UMass, Amos College, they are where the access to food is different. Um, I think maybe separating that out to study actual issues of access, it'll be useful. You know. in, even in Amherst Center, I think easy access to excellent food, you know. Um, of course, there's no grocery store. That's, so I think in terms of easy access to fresh and everything, it might be relevant to um, households who are actually cooking and making food themselves rather than like a lot of students who are residing, they go to dining commons. So I think that one maybe I think you could mention because it, in, the, in the data it was showing like UMass having like far away from uh, a grocery store and everything. It may not be a problem. And... Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, it's definitely an area that we will kind of look further into. Um, and yeah, through getting some more data um, that's specific to the certain um, census tracts, we don't necessarily have um, all of these things teased out with the available um, data now. So, you know, looking forward to phase three and kind of getting some hands-on feedback from the community is gonna be really helpful in um, separating out the real issues um, within census tracts. Uh, one additional one is uh, the PBTA. Uh, when you, uh, I think the frequency and everything during the non-weekdays and also during holidays, that's, a, that's an issue, you know. Um, um, but majority of the time I'm also seeing, you know, PBTA going empty, <laughs> running like a big buses <laughs> uh, with only few to few uh, passengers there. You know, so I think one alternate mechanisms probably you can think about is to have um, smaller size vehicles which doesn't consume so much fuel, but exclusively focused on underserved communities. You know, so I mean, those are alternative things we can think about instead of asking PBTA to run more frequently with large capacity buses, having huge emission issues and stuff like that. So that's, yeah, that's just a suggestion. Yes, hi. Um, this is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Yes, hi. Good evening. Hi. Sorry. Hi, I um, came in in the middle of the community assessment, but I just wanted to give a few points. Um, one, um, the survival center, I think some of the reason why there might be less people there is because of the, the, the delivery service, um, which is much easier for people um, to have the food delivered. And I know that was um, a service that was expended um, which is very helpful for people who don't have transportation. And I would just like to know from the assessment, is it possible to know how many, um, how, how many families that do not have their own cars, how, how do we find that number? Because it seems that even for those who may be considered low income, they probably do have a car. And I just would like to know, you know, how we can find out the exact number of, you know, families or individuals that do not have their own transportation and are relying on public transportation that possible to know. Um, I think at least in terms of the data available, we don't have that um, specific um, data that has been collected previously. Um, it's a potential area for you know further research. I think there would need to be um, surveys and such kind of distributed and it's not something that we currently have, but um, yeah, it's an interesting point to bring up and something that um, we could consider for future research. Okay. 
that's a excellent point but i'm also wondering if the town has that data you know, because they register for taxes almost all cars which are owned we pay taxes for the town also so they might have a list of households who don't have cars you know from that i'm just suggesting there's a possibility of data mm. Was, was that a specific question, Tim? No, that's a suggestion. There might be some data at the town level we could tap into. Thank you. And and I'm also wondering about the income levels. You know, we are showing in the bar charts very low income levels for students. You know. Um, that's per capita. Um, I know that it's, it's purely based on employment, right? Um, so we could maybe separate those out, you know, uh, uh, if possible, to show the per capita income only for those non-students, you know, uh, who are wage earners, because much of the student population, I, I think. They're not just income, but also the loans and all or different things, you know, are burdening them. So, but I'm just curious, you know, when we compare uh, different districts, I think it will be helpful to census districts. It will be helpful to have this regions with schools separated out because that 35,000 and then you have 3,000 at one end, you know. That's sort of like the million dollar question. <laughs> that everybody asks, how do we get data on the town residents versus students? And it's a conundrum that everybody faces. And with the black census and with other census, it, um, it, it's, it's a question that keeps coming up and being repeated that how do we get that data? And how do we separate it? Um, Emily, have you come across any way to do that? Um, I can't say that I have. I mean, I can definitely see how you could at least just ignore the students, I suppose, in a lot of these situations. But I don't know if that would paint the kind of holistic picture of the town because realistically they are a part of the town. So I think it's a, a tricky question that doesn't really have a good answer necessarily. Uh, yes, and I, I think you, in the beginning of your presentation, I think you very succinctly asked that question about how does the student's population affect the economic functionality of the town? I think that's an an excellent and important question. And I think it's a question that um, is asked in many different ways. Um, Maureen, do you have any questions? Oops. Oh. Whoops. You're uh, muted. You're muted, Ma Maureen. Can you, um, I'm I, you're muted, Maureen. Oh, I, there you, go. there you go. No, you had it. You had it for a minute. Yeah. Uh, unmute. Yeah, yeah unmute. <laughs> okay. Um, the, even then, all students aren't the same. I mean, many of the students in Amherst are the, you know, 18 to 22 year olds who are still somewhat dependent on family at home, get their meals at in campus and kind of live on campus or close to campus. And have less to do with either using town services or providing town services. But then there are these, there are other students who really are more part of the town, the graduate students, but even other younger groups of students who are living and shopping and doing all kinds of things. Um, it's, a, it's, it's just really tricky about how they interact, how, how the populations do end up interacting. 
Um, and, and it's a huge one for housing. I mean, there are so many considerations, um, but it, it's, yeah, you can't just, I don't think you can just like get rid of them all <laughs> and forget about them. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I, I guess just seeing this with older Amherst uh, adults, you know, the loss of the use of a car, you know, the, the, it really requires a car to live in most parts of Amherst to, to function and, um, and to, you know, to have a kind of flexible, robust transit system that can support people to go where they need to go when they need to go would be an amazing benefit. It, you know, and I agree that having big buses driving around on a circular route isn't oh, going to be the, the answer to that one either. Um, but even they are the vans that go and pick up for, for individual rides and things like that. But, um, it, it always takes about 10 times as long as it would to do it any other way. <laughs> um, so it, those are big problems in the immersed, I think, is the transportation yeah. and, um, shopping. Can I just add one other comment? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I would say that um, Amherst is the only place that I've lived that the buses, you know, are free, which is a big benefit to, you know, low income people and young people who can just hop on a bus and go into town. Um, so I don't necessarily think that you know, the transit system is the problem. Um, at, at my at my experience, you know, you have to do what you have to do, and you know, food food justice is a big, you know, important topic for me. And and I just know as a parent, you just you have to get to the grocery store how you get to the grocery store, and if you don't have a car, you you have to take the bus. Um, um, but I think that the the access to services is is limited, um, and so I would just you know I would just encourage any you know survey or assessment to really you know find out what services um, low income individuals and families need because I know. Um, for, for from my experience, health, accessing health services has been difficult in Amherst. Thank you, Lauren. Any uh, other que questions or comments for Emily? So another aspect is uh, walkability of the town, you know, um, beyond vehicles, you know, I mean, um, many, for example, many stores are in Hadley, <laughs> and if you if you have um, apartment complex like Renew or Brooks Boulders at one, and if people wanted to access some super you know supermarkets, you know, there's no really a way to walk, you know, <laughs> uh, because you know in between on on East Hadley, you know, there is clear distinction, you know, so you have nice walkway until the town border. And after the, you know, once if you enter Hadley, there is nothing, you know. Uh, I mean, I have seen um, many, many families actually walking without any, you know, very, very dangerous, you know. I mean, I'm just saying, in accessing that type of a walkability and bike paths, access, mm -hmm. all this should be some sort of a plan so that, you know, it, it, it gives uh, a better access for a lot of families. Yeah, that's a really um, important point. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emily. And um, we have a meeting coming up, um, getting ready for phase three. Emily is the chair lead person on all of this. And we have two other um, four plus one master students that will be working with us on phase three. And one of the students is listening 
And so we're looking forward to moving to key informant interviews and the focus slash listening session groups um, coming up to get more of the, the nitty, nitty, nitty gritty data um, that's qualitative versus quantitative. So thank you, Emily. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Okay, I think Emily's just done an amazing job um, putting gathering the data and putting it all together. So next we're moving to new business with the geothermal well applications. And I see John's here. We oh. we have Ed here. Yeah. And me, Ed. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we have two new ones this month, uh, plus there is some survey testing going on at the new Fort River School site, uh, which will eventually be an 80 to 100 well system. Um, the part of the plan to meet the town's um, net zero building um, goal. Um, but that the testing started, um, the test will eventually convert into a well um, so that it's it's not wasted effort. I believe they went back and did the thermal testing there this week. But Aaron Jacques, who's the wetlands administrator, and I did visit the site and we're in close contact with the engineer um, from GZA Associates, um, who are the architects, architectural firm. The two that are up for permits tonight are 46 Kingman Road and 57 Bay Road. They're two very different properties. Um, Kingman is easy because it's a previously undeveloped lot. I think that's the Echo Hill section, of Kingman Road, that backs up to um, the railroad line. Mm -hmm. And then across from that, it's um, Henry Street. And um, it's just a cleared lot at this point. I mean, it, it's, it's a blank canvas. The trees are gone. Um, it's ready to construct. Um, and when Erin Jacques looked at that one, she said the Conservation Commission had no concerns about that property. There's no wetlands jurisdiction there. They had no um, concerns for that property. So that one I would highly recommend that it get its, its permit approval. And if you want me to talk about the other one too, or if you want to consider that one. Well, why don't we just consider that one? Okay. Any questions, Tim or Maureen? I didn't have any. Tim? Um, so it's a clean street, it's a cleared lot. I'm just yes. curious if there are plans coming up, if they have a well, I think, are they going to build something there or? I'm just curious, you know. Um, we have a, a part of the building permit op um, application was a an outline of the building, which I think was included in your packet. Yeah, I had um, I had seen that. It's sort of like a a diagram of, of the house on right. the right. The proposed floor plan. The geothermal was, well over in the one corner. Right. So um, driveway on the left, two car um, attached to the garage. And I don't recall whether it's more than one story or not. I'm... You couldn't tell from the. Yeah, yep. the I'm sorry, I did, didn't review the building permit. If, I don't see bedrooms marked on the first floor, so I'm assuming it does have a second floor. But at any rate, it's a single borehole to supply the this single family um, building. It is state. Both of these tonight are proposed. Um, from the well driller, uh, Connecticut Valley Artesian wells, um, as opposed to uh, the last couple months, we've had proposals from Dandelion Energy, which is kind of a, a one-stop shop operation. Uh, they mm -hmm. provide the design services, the coordination of the HVAC systems, as well as the well drilling, the you know cleanup. Um, landscaping afterwards, removal of 
spoils from the site if that's what's been coordinated. Mm -hmm. um, those are done with the smaller rigs. These are would be done probably with conventional size rigs, mm -hmm. but both pieces of property have easy access for the large standard uh, well drilling trucks, which operate faster, um, but are more intrusive. They're much heavier machines. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the Bay Road documents in the packet. Maybe I, I, I missed. Were there. Okay. Yeah, uh, this I... is, it's the, the house just west of where the Kestrel uh, organization is located next to uh, Plumbrook Pond. Uh -huh. so one property over from their okay. new headquarters. Um, that one, there are some wetlands concerns not necessarily with the siting so it may need updated mapping and so Aaron Jacques is coordinating with the homeowner um, about updating the map um, I, th I think from our standpoint it's um, again a fairly straightforward project easy access fairly level ground um, that one is a three well three borehole pro project mm -hmm. Um, I have a question, Ed. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that we can simplify this process so that you don't have to come every month? And we uh, is this something we should be looking at to to make it more streamlined? Um, it's important for for us to know where these wells are. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if they're going to affect the aquifers, but neither the aquifers are all off of Southeast street from what I, when I look at maps. So these aren't going to affect any of our aquifers. Um, so it's important to really know where they are, but um, is there any input on how we can streamline and make it easier for you, easier for us? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, I've been talking with Jen and um, Mainly, uh, we have Erin Jacques's um, keen interest and her expertise. I think she's been doing wetlands work, I believe she said, for 18 years, um, mm -hmm. both for private engineering companies as well as other municipalities. And she is working on a checklist. Um, she and I sit in the same room when we're both in the office, and we've been um, had a running conversation about what is it that brings her to a point where she can say, the Conservation Commission say has no interest in the property, has no jurisdiction. And by using um, mass maps and a number of other mapping tools and records the Conservation Commission has on previously mapped areas, um, she's able to check probably seven or eight sources of information um, to the locations that we're giving her with our map, our well application and get to that point. Um, they're having a conversation currently in the Conservation Commission about whether geothermal wells can be regarded as minimally intrusive and um, not in need of um, a determination from the Conservation Commission, which most of the state does operate under that mm -hmm. sort of guideline, the Western district is more conservative and Amherst so far has been, but it's, is open to discussing this idea. I, I've heard from you all in these meetings and I'd like to see um, maybe if we can get the state wells um, staffer perhaps to come and answer questions sometime about whether, or what, what is the potential impact on aquifers, on the groundwater by you know, uh, one, two, three geothermal wells, or in the case of like the school, 80 to 100, you know, in a fairly small location. Um, I know in talking to the well drillers on site and engineers, they keep pointing out that it's um, a grouted borehole when it's done, that uh, there is a plastic tube that goes down to the bottom and back up is grouted in place. And it's considered I think stable at that point, that there's no 
it's a closed loop system too. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, I'm not an expert. Um, I think I, you know, would I'd be happy to see if we can get the well person to attend a meeting, say if you'd like that and answer questions. Um, but conservation is considering this right now. And I think a lot of our concerns are based on conservation being happy. Well, I'm looking at, at the process. Yeah. Um, well, you guys so already, I think, <laughs> you know, trust me to do septic systems. Yes. And I'd, I'd like to get it to that point, ideally, where, you know, it'll help the, the applicant and it'll be simpler and easier. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll go through the same process, I think, where we're getting conservation's input. And right. this would only be after you felt as though yeah. it's okay to delegate it delegate that authority. So it's an administrative review in the inspections office rather than a board of health monthly review. Yeah, um, because drinking wells are a different thing uh, than the, the geothermal closed loop wells. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's figure out how to do that in the future. But right now, mm -hmm. what we need to do is approve these two well, these two geothermal wells. Does anyone have any more questions or does someone want to make a motion to accept them? We'll do them separately so that it's not confusing. Yeah, and I would say these are subject to approval by the Conservation Commission. In the Kingman Road case, they've already said they have no jurisdiction on the property. Mm -hmm. And the other one, that's under consideration now. So they will not be issued a permit for the Bay Road one um, until Conservation Commission is satisfied with the. Um, the so should we wait and vote, and vote on that at another meeting? I would suggest going ahead if you're comfortable okay. with that, because um, what I'm, I mean, these projects are being driven by energy costs. Mm -hmm. They're expensive yeah. projects, um, and um, you know, winter is is coming. <laughs> So, okay, so the Bay Road one, we can uh, make a motion to approve the Bay Road geothermal well pending the Conservation Commission's approval. Is that how we could should write make that one? Works for me. Yep. Well, then I'll make the motion to approve the uh, fifty-seven uh, Bay Road geothermal well application pending the Conservation Commission approval. I have that seconded? I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, then let's vote. Um, Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? Lauren, can you hear us? Lauren, can you vote? Yeah, she's yes, yes. Um, I I I say yes. Okay, and Nancy, yes. Okay. So it's been that one's passed. Now 45 Kingman Road geothermal well application that yep. we Fort 46 Kingman Road. I mean 46. Okay. Oh 46. Oh, I have 45 written here on my piece of paper. Um 46 King Monroe. Um, the, I'll make a motion that we approve the geothermal well permit. Can I have that seconded? I'll second I that. Second. Any further discussion? I just had a question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But the other wells before, they were on um, private property. Is you said there's a difference, like conservation land, or I just didn't understand. But there, so there the, are... um, yeah, okay. Bay, Bay Road already has a hot, a house on a developed lot. I think it's eight plus acres. Um, Kingman Road is a, a previously unbuilt lot, Lauren, in the middle of uh -huh. um, Echo Hill. So it has houses on each side, but it never has had a house in this particular lot. And so currently it's been cleared for construction. There's a building permit underway for the house. And they've also submitted this permit for a geothermal well to be the HVAC, the heating and 
cooling um, component for the proposed house. Okay. Okay. Did that answer your question, Warren? I just, I'm trying to understand the difference between con conservation land and the private. It, it wasn't conservation land, it's the Conservation Commission um, okay. giving you the okay. Not, not that it was conservation land, it's the Conservation Commission. Yeah. They review these. Right. Okay. Okay. So, that's, that's better. Yeah, on, Did on that King answer the question? On King uh, Road, uh, there are no wetlands concerns. There's no ponds, streams. It's not within 200 feet of any known wetland. And that was determined to be outside the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. Bay Road is a larger property that has wetlands on it, marked wetlands. Um, it's been constructed on for the house that's there in the not too distant past, maybe 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and the mapping is probably going to be brought up to date just to make sure that this is not within an area of concern. Mm -hmm. I'm, I guess it's just hard for me to understand and I haven't really uh, the research that I, I should, but when the, when the wells are put in place, is it, is it one house? The, um, for a single house, one to three well holes are what we've seen in the past for applications. Um, it, I think it's just an engineering question about how much heat is required, how much cooling is required by the house. And then the Kingman Road proposal, they've determined one hole can do it. It may go as far as 500 feet deep. Um, the Bay Road House, the plan calls for three holes. And I'm not sure the depth from those, but generally I think three to 500 feet is what we've seen in the past. Okay. But that I, I'm I'm still trying to understand. Mm -hmm. You know what? How 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 to vote if I don't quite know the impact or you know? But I'm glad that the conservation commission is you know also as well. So yeah, thank you. That's all I have. Okay. okay, so now we're going to vote on approving the well on Kingman Road. So it's been, motion's been made, it's been seconded. Now all in favor of um, approving the Kingman Road geothermal well. Maureen? Yes. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy, yes. Okay, so both wells are approved now. Ed. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Can, can before it off. leaves, no, um, yes. I'm just curious. Um, you said 80 to 100 wells coming up. For the. Uh, that looks like school. a pretty intense operation. Um, and you know, I think checklist based on wetlands mm -hmm. is perfectly fine, but it's only for wetlands. It's not doing anything regarding groundwater impacts or subsurface impacts. You know, so um, I think if you're developing a checklist which will help to clear at the inspection level, uh, it should have some sort of a dens density of wells taken care. How many wells? Uh, per square meter or whatever the unit area, but also how deep uh, in terms of potential impacts in you know, the subsurface, you know, aquifers and stuff. So uh, just because the Conservation Commission is clearing wetlands doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it's not going to have it. And I think sure. uh, groundwater impact. So I think we have to be very careful with that. Yeah, well, um, 
I don't know if John Tobiason might be available still to the board, but that certainly was an area of his expertise, I would guess, um, you know, on impact of wells. They, well, they, his work was more in drinking water wells, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, I will reach out to the state. Yeah, these that. are mostly impacts are during the construction site because after that it's sealed. Mm -hmm. And so as long as the uh, construction mitigation is done correctly, and then the, the building inspectors can look at that one, and we, we should be fine with that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, can I say uh, one more thing? <laughs> Go can ahead. you hear me? Yes. yes. I I do I do remember um, reading or watching something somewhere that when water is warm, there is certain um, can grow more, and there's water life that you know, was affected by, you know, water being, um, the temperature being raised or lowered. So I just am wondering, like, do the, ger do, not the germ, the, the geothermal wells, do they affect any streams or lakes, you know, in that way? Um, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, it's just a question, not necessarily, you know, but I, anything that is going down in the ground, I'm, it is going to have some effect on, you know, the, 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 the area that it's going into. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, to understand better. Okay. Can I, can I answer that quickly? Mm-hmm. So I, I think temperature has impact on aquatic life, but it's mostly in the streams and lakes in the surface water bodies. I think here we are talking about um, more of these, you know, wells which are going into the ground, you know, and uh, uh, it might have some impact on the microbes and the top, but I don't think there is big impact in terms of temperature uh, from the ground, uh, geothermal wells. Did that answer your question, Lauren? Is that something that um, uh, um, checklist or whoever's doing the checklist? Well, that's that's another that's another that's separate from this right now, and then. Ed will be working on that with others and get back to us with what what would I'm just saying, you know, how do we how do we follow up or if we have questions, how do we how do we direct those questions to the people who can answer it? Jen, can you jump in? At all? I, I, I think I think it depends on the question, and then who is the correct person to answer it. Um, it, it could be Ed. It could be conserve. It really depends on the question. Okay. Okay. And Ed, do you have someone at the state you can talk to and consult with? Yes, I'm sorry I didn't already do that, but I can get that information to Jen and she can share it with you. There is a person that coordinates well reporting and well questions that we can go to. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's somebody at MassDEP, I think it's somebody at the state, but I'll, I'll look into that and get that information. Yeah. You know, it's it's easy for me to see these one, two, three well sites and not think anything of it. When you're talking about a hundred in that field behind uh, with Fort River School, it seems like a different kind of animal. But yeah. um, I'm sure it works. Yeah, but interest is growing certainly, and it's you know even though it seems like we're 
being inundated with these. This is probably nothing compared to what it could be if it catches on. So getting ahead of this issue would be the best for all of us. Well, fuel prices rising is thriving this, I'm sure. Um, yeah. It is, absolutely. It's it's not um, a low cost solution, but you know, if you can afford to do it in the long run, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And there are increasing incentives for doing it. Yeah, right, they're tax incentives. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ed. Oh, you're welcome. And we'll thank probably you. hear from you next month. <laughs> okay, yeah. take care. Thanks, okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Take care. Now we have the director's report. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen. All right, everyone. I'm going to go over um, the COVID numbers. And I want to remind people that um, some of the numbers we're going to discuss were distributed to the board members, and they can be found on the Board of Health webpage. Um, at amherstma.gov, Board of Health, and then there's agenda packets, and you can see some of the data um, that we have. But um, our COVID case counts um, are low, and we all know that the case counts aren't capturing all the, um, the real cases of illness at a, at a true rate. We have asymptomatic cases, mild cases, less PCR, dramatically less PCR testing and um, antigen tests that don't need to be reported. Um, we post our, our cases daily. Um, the state um, Department of Public Health has, um, gets some information daily, but they post it weekly every Thursday. And I can see us doing the same at some point as moving to a weekly um, posting. And also there's you know, talk about moving to how do we um, report flu? So are we gonna move to a, a model of um, flu reporting in the future? So that would be looking at like sentinel provider sites, not every provider um, giving information, but just um, special uh, selected groups and then hospitalizations. Um, so that's it for the case numbers. But I do wanna say, um, if you go to the MassDPH dashboard and the interactive dashboard, um, they have a really good map of the different variants. And it's interesting to see, it's a link to the CDC, that the BA.5 that causes so much trouble is beginning to recede. And we have the BA.4.6, if I'm saying it correctly with the dots. Um, they don't think um, the BA.4.6 will cause a large wave of issues this, this fall, um, this winter, um, because it doesn't have the mutations on the spike protein. Um, I'm reading my notes. But I think what we're looking at now with spread is more behavior. So we need to consider um, what cold weather um, has ahead of us. Um, cases may rise. And um, obviously, there's still a lot of unknown. So we do continue to, to monitor our numbers. We also do monitor our um, uh, Amherst wastewater, and that's posted on the town website. Um, it's a system that we have with um, Amherst um, Department of Public Works. Um, they get three samples um, per week. We send it off to um, Jamaica Plain, and it's being analyzed still by Biobot. Um, at some point, it might be analyzed by the state when they get that um, capacity to do so. Um, just one note with our wastewater, we love putting it up on the website. We post it outside, um, but interpreting the numbers are very different from other data. Um, we post um, this raw data and a lot of studies do this um, data smoothing, they do trimming. So the five-day trimmed average, some studies do this, that they look at the data over a week and they um, they um, they take the, out the highest and the lowest and use the three remaining points. So the best thing with the wastewater is really looking at um, trends. And another thing um, is that the data um, for the wastewater, it doesn't um, specifically identify the number of infected people. Um, so one person can contribute quite a lot of gene copies compared to someone else that's positive. 
So if you look at the numbers and the, and the wastewater numbers and the copies are going up, doesn't necessarily mean it's that number of people going up. So it's one public health um, key indicator that we continue to, to use and, and monitor, but we look at other data as well, um, hospitalizations in Western Mass at Cooley Dickinson, new illnesses, that type of thing. Um, moving on to rapid antigen tests. Um, the Amherst Health Department, we received our fourth shipment of rapid antigen tests um, in, uh, when was it? September 22nd. And so it was one of our biggest um, uh, uh, shipments. It was 20,300. In the next week or two, we're going to do a larger push to get them out to um, different um, uh, social service um, organizations, places of worship, you know, um, uh, some of our partners, the Amherst Survival Center, Family Outreach, those um, folks that we can further distribute it for us. Um, when these kits are done, they all expire in January. So I hope we can get them into the hands of people for the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Um, we hope we continue to get more antigen tests, but I just don't know what's going to happen with the funding. But when we're done with this, the, the town would have distributed 57,760 tests, antigen tests. And I'll say it again. I say it every time we have a meeting. I do love the antigen tests. Um, if your question is, am I infectious? It's going to give you a pretty good result. So a positive, assume you're, assume you're infectious. If it's negative and you've been exposed or you're symptomatic, they usually give you two tests in a kit. Test on day five and then 48 hours later, test again. So on day seven, or you can do three and five. Um, <laughs> so we love the antigen tests. Um, vaccination, we continue to have vaccine clinics um, every Thursday here at the Bangs Community Center. Um, we have um, uh, our vaccine uh, volunteers. We have vaccinators that come in. We, we just respect and love them and make what makes it work. We have great COVID ambassadors still, and we have some really excellent UMass students. Um, one gentleman, I believe, is in the audience, and I can't tell you how incredible this intern is. I don't know if I should say his name, but we're really lucky with the interns that we have working with us. Um, we are administering the um, Pfizer and we have Moderna um, bivalent. If you ask any place for the booster, you're going to get the bivalent. We are not giving the monovalent as a booster anymore. And today, or was it yesterday, the FDA approved um, the bivalent booster for ages 5 to 11. So all those folks that have been waiting for that, it goes starts with the FDA, then it goes to the CDC, has to be approved by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice. So by next week, um, 5 through 11 age group can get that, that booster. Um, I did well with all my first vaccines, but the booster, this one um, gave me some arm pain and I got pretty fatigued. So I just tell everyone it's just so worth getting it. It's really just um, the best thing we can do to protect the community and, uh, uh, and ourselves. And I think I've been hearing a little arm pain from other people. I don't know. Has anyone else had the booster yet? Have they had any issues? I just had mild um, arm pain and I had Moderna, Moderna and Pfizer this time, but nothing else. Yeah, great. Anybody else have the bivalent yet? I had the bivalent Moderna, but then I got sick with something else. So I oh, don't no. know what was no. what. <laughs> yeah. no. um, I'm sure I had a little extra fatigue from the, maybe from the vaccine, but. Um, every um, other Tuesday, we um, have webinars with the Department of Public Health in Boston. Um, they used to be twice a week, and then there were once a week, now it's every other week. And there are a lot of great folks um, that support us here. Um, one is Dr. Katie Brown. I just think she's such a rock star. But one little thing she said is that we're not gonna be calling it long COVID anymore. The term is post-acute COVID. So anyhow, I say that to you just because I see that there's one study. So one study does not mean it's, it's, it's you know, the, the gold and it, it covers everything, but that the, um, the boosters 
are beginning to reduce um, reported risk um, for post-acute symptoms. So anyhow, I'm really happy about that. So hopefully that means less long COVID, oh, less post-COVID if you're getting vaccinated. So I think that's important. That's my COVID update. Thank you. Any questions? Um, under the director's update, um, item B is um, called Mental Health and Stress, an event at Butternut Farm. And Lauren, are you able to talk about that? I'm certainly ready if you're not on. Um, yes, yeah, I'm oh. here. <laughs> I didn't know. Oh. Do you want do you want me to introduce it and you can talk or what do you want to? I just I'm I'm, I'm talking on asking you by surprise. Did you say you'll talk about it? You know, Lauren, we can't hear you. We're breaking up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, so Lauren, you just jump in when you're ready. So Lauren has spearheaded an event at Butternut Farm and it's called Mental Health and Stress. And it's gonna be on November 3rd, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the Butternut Farm community room. And thank you, Lauren, for organizing this. It's gonna include Earl Miller, who is the health, um, the director of CREST, the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service. And it's really a time for people to go um, listen to Earl. I hope everyone can join us there. He's just a, a brilliant speaker, so much to say. Um, discuss your questions, concerns, <laughs> give your perspective on mental health um, and stress, especially now with COVID, how important that is. Um, I'll be there to talk about COVID and then we'll have some adult KN95s, children and adult surgical masks, antigen tests and some refreshments. Um, Lauren, anything else? Yes, yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes, thank you. This came up with the topic. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for helping me with the topic. Like yes, I've been practicing it out. Um, and um, it, it's just a, a community uh, driven conversation to talk about. You know, um, what they have been experiencing uh, in stress, how it, it makes it much harder to, you know, the um, term you said post acute COVID, um, people are, are still, you know, feeling the, the, the effect of COVID and just, you know, trying to, you know, fix how to to move forward. So I just am happy that having a, a community conversation and I was able to give the flyer to um the doctor. Maybe he, you know, stopped by. It's a Thursday, four to six, and there will be light refreshments. Um I hope the town counselors are I will take them, you know, on this call, but, um, they are excited. So hopefully, you know, people will and, and share their opinion. Now, can any of our graduate students go to or other board members if they'd like to come? Sure. Okay, great. So thank you for spearheading this, Lauren. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is sort of the grand announcement. Um, tomorrow at 10, um, Lillian and I are speaking with um, Brianna, and we're going to start sort of pushing out the announcement. So we, we have the flyer, so that will go out through social media and all the other places that we, um, we advertise events. So we'll start seeing that uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you to the two of you. Good. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, I'm gonna move on to um, the director's update item C. So this is something I've labeled outdoor air monitoring. Um, 
so I, uh, a year ago, there was um, talk of getting a grant for purple air monitoring air sensors. So what they do is they monitor um, real time levels of fine particulate matter and ozone. So that was last year. So now this year we have the opportunity um, to have some of uh, these air monitors in Amherst. And this interests me because I think Springfield, Holyoke, um, the Pioneer Valley have had a long history of high asthma rates. Um, so we're gonna be getting two purple air sensors, and I'll give some people some links. Um, they will be installed in town and they will be um, relaying information on the air quality um, real time. And I'll give everyone the, uh, the links. Um, what we'll do with this information, I'm not sure. I think it'll just sort of unfold, but, but it's not just us doing it. So let me tell you the organizations that are sponsoring this. So this is what I'm reading from is the Pioneer Valley Healthy Air Network. Um, and they've re recently um, tried to understand how air quality contributes to high asthma rates. Um, they are uh, uh, joining forces with the Pioneer Valley Asthma Coalition, uh, Coalition the PVAC, Live Well Springfield, and the Yale, some Yale University researchers, Earthwatch Institute. So these researchers from Yale, they're coming up and looking at the Pioneer Valley um, and um, hoping to expand across the state. So these little air sensors are just like a little pack of cigarettes and they'll be put somewhere um, in the town and I'll keep people updated with this information. So anyhow, it's a start to a conversation um, if you do go to Purple Air or you go to Pioneer Valley Healthy Air Network, you can see um, uh, where these are down in Springfield and the, the real-time readouts. So hmm. that's something new. I think air, outdoor air quality is something we really need to start thinking about. I know we all are thinking about it, but I'm interested in it and how can we we assess it, but what do we do with the information? I also think indoor air quality is very important as well, as we all do. Um, that's it for the purple air. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so thank you all those great companies or organizations that are helping us. Um, item D under the director's update is the Childhood Immunization Clinic. Um, we started this up um, in the last two weeks and thank you everyone to help get this going. And Dr. Malay, thank you for writing the orders and just you know being a champion. So uh, again, what the immunization clinic is, is we have um, childhood vaccines here in the Amherst Health Department, those that are mandated for the school. We provide them to students that are unvaccinated, um, that are um, underinsured or uninsured. And what it does is they folks can come up um, from different countries, out of state, um, get their children vaccinated, and they can immediately go into school. And I've always said it this way, that it's one part um, vaccination and nine parts education. So we've done 16 vaccines already, and so happy with that. But it was two kids, but 16 <laughs> vaccines sounds better. Um, but what we do is we actually walk them to the window and we say, you see the Misanti Health Center right down there. That's where you can get health insurance. And we've already told Deanna Soler at the Misanti Health Center, she's expecting you. And we walk them down to that beautiful health center down there. So anyhow, thank you everybody um, for getting that going. It's really satisfying. That's my director's update. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now we have public comment. If there's anyone who would like to ask a question or speak, please raise your hand. Okay. So Eric. we do. Have, Eric. Yeah. yeah. So Eric, if you can please state your name, where you live. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's Eric Backrack. I live on Shootsbury Road in North Amherst. I want to first thank you so much for your really, you know, continuously, you know, um, really hardworking um, board of health and 
um, uh, I'm just very, always very impressed every time I sit in a meeting how seriously you take your work and that's very gratifying as a, as a, as a member of the public in Amherst. Um, I have spoken um, uh, uh, to, to uh, one of you, um, to um, the committee before, um, but it was after I had um, spoken with a water supply protection committee. Um, uh, the, uh, my, my initial contact with the water supply protection committee arose uh, due to the large number of proposed um, large scale solar arrays for that would supplant forest land in North Amherst. There's one proposed for North Amherst and there's several proposed that would actually run, be, be located within a, the watershed that, that flows right into the, um, into the Atkins Reservoir. When I uh, addressed the Water Supply Pro Protection Committee last January about my concern about the effect of clear cutting on the watershed, groundwater and surface water, the fact that the three um, proposed um, solar arrays in Shutesbury are uh, um, that they're, they're two main tributaries that flow right through those proposed um, arrays that flow directly into the to the Atkins Reservoir, the Dean and the Nurse and the Nurse Brooks. Um, and when I ro rose, uh, when I raised my question about uh, to the Water Supply Protection Committee. Um, uh, about the uh, quality of water and how it can be, um, how can we rely on consistent quality water uh, as, as private well owners. They said that they represented the public water supply and that it was the Board of Health that represents private well owners. I was gratified to hear the robust conversation regarding geothermal wells and comments regarding surface water and groundwater and, and aquifers. And um, at the, the January meeting of the Supply Protection Committee, they had agreed to um, appoint a subcommittee that would review the potential impact on clear cutting on water supply, including private wells. The draft report was released about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And I'm wondering whether anybody from the Board of Health or the Health Department is gonna be, gonna read the report, gonna respond to the report, um, in that report, it does say that four and a half to five percent of Amherst residents rely on well water, and most of them are in North Amherst, which is where uh, there are a number of neighborhoods that have uh, purely uh, re re purely rely on well water as their source of drinking water. And I'm wondering whether, um, given that the um, the uh, Solar Bylaw Working Group is relying on um, this report um, and um, to begin to make some judgment about um, judicious placement of, of, uh, of large-scale solar in, in Amherst. Um, one, and th there is no representative on the bylaw working group from the Board of Health that I'm wondering if they will, you will have any, any um, uh, a response to the report, whether you will be, will, whether you will, the somebody from the committee or the board will um, be included in the dialogue regarding the impact. Uh, so we will, will we have so Eric, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but we do limit the time. I am, I am unaware of this report. I don't know if Jennifer's aware of this report. Can you send us this report? Well, yeah, certainly it's Stephanie Ciccarello has access to the report. The report came right from the Water Supply Protection Committee. I will locate it and, uh, and send it to you, but I think that it's a public document that really sh should have actually been sent to, to you, given that you govern and regulate 
private will. So I'm surprised. So Jen, have you gotten a copy of this report? Well, I, I just want to say that the public comment, usually it's not interactive. I don't, I'm yes. not used to answering this questions. Is yeah. This is true. I will then true. We just listen. So, okay. So we are, yes, I'm sorry. So, um, and it's, and it's, it's really two to three minutes. So we're going to end it, end it there. And um, I, I think what we should do is get a copy of this report and look at it. And and we can we can do that at a future meeting. Can I can I say one thing? The the Water Supply Protection Committee will be meeting early November that regarding the draft report. Um, I can give you the specific date if you'd like that. But all public comments regarding the draft report are due by October 28th. So okay. I'm just want to. I know it's an not an interactive point of counterpoint, but I'm just I'm concerned as a private well owner about the quality of my work. Okay, thank you, and um, uh, we will get a copy of the report and and look at it. Okay. I don't see any other comments. Okay. Um, the last um, piece on the agenda is topics not anticipated by the chair. Um, I'm just going to make three comments. One is um, Chief Livingston is going to come to our December meeting to talk about gun safety risks and protective uh, factors in Amherst. And at our um, last meeting I had brought up, and it's something for us to consider in the future, is um, wood stoves. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because the cost of heating oil is going up and up. And I want to just make sure people in Amherst are safe if they're using wood stoves. And um, we can look into that in the future. And I am not going to be here for the next meeting, so we need someone else to chair the November 10th meeting. And with that, um, there's nothing else on the agenda. Anyone else have any comments for the good of the uh, board? And if not, um, may have a motion to adjourn. I can make a motion to adjourn today's meeting. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Maureen, all in favor? Yes. Tim? Aye. And I don't see Lauren here anymore. I don't think so. I think we lost her. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I will vote to adjourn too. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Bye.